Thanks to Mallory, some time travel, and a gas-guzzling SUV, we survived the apocalypse. Hallelujah. Greg, I still can't believe it actually ended that way. I can, but for now, we can all relax. Uh, that's until Timothy and Emily's, you know, Antichrist 2.0 baby decides to take over the world. Again. Shit. Now, while we wait for season nine, we thought it would be a good idea to update our American Horror Story Connected Universe video with all eight seasons of the show. Again, friends, make sure to stick around for this entire video because we are deep diving into all the connections between season one and eight. We're gonna talk about all the characters. Almost all oh, the characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The setting of American Horror Story is a common thread that we've observed throughout the series, specifically the great state of Massachusetts. In Murder House, the Harmons moved from Boston to LA. In Asylum, Briarcliff Manor was built there in 1908. Season 3's Coven storyline showed us flashbacks of colonial Massachusetts with the Salem Witch Trials, which would be present-day Danvers, Massachusetts. And Freak Show's Elsa Mars worked in a Boston circus in the 1930s. Massachusetts is also where Pepper lived prior to being committed to the asylum. Now this might be a stretch, but even in Hotel, James Marsh's accent was described as a Boston Brahmin accent, so it's possible that the serial killer was born in the Boston area. Oh. Ah, we're all here now. Let's sit. Only so many hours in the night. Roanoke and Colt were the only seasons that didn't have a more literal connection to Massachusetts. Now how about Florida? That's where Freak Show took place during the 1950s, but Murder House's Vivian Harmon also mentioned that she had a family in Florida. It's possible that Vivian was related to the doctor who Desiree visited in season four. The doctor's daughter mentioned that she was also from Boston. Now they might not be sisters, but there's a chance they may be related. Now in Apocalypse, we also traveled back to a handful of locations that we've previously seen. That includes Miss Robichaux's Academy for Exceptional Young Ladies, which is in New Orleans, and the murder house where the Harmons called home, as well as Hotel Cortez out in Los Angeles. We went through every door and every window, but we couldn't escape the hotel. Now that we've talked about the locations, let's talk about the characters themselves and how they connect to the whole story. Starting with Lana Winters. Now Winters, of course, is played by AHS veteran Sarah Paulson and has made a significant mark on the series. The investigative journalist is the star of Asylum. In 1964, Winters attempted to expose some of Briarcliff Manor's darkest secrets. Unfortunately, she was wrongly committed to the asylum and just barely survived a run-in with Bloody Face. She went on to release a tell-all book and documentary that would shut down the asylum in the early 1970s. Now, Winters would return, and in the present day, she was kind of a Barbara Walters type interviewer. Yeah, she gave an interview with acquitted murderer at the time, Lee Harris, from Roanoke season finale. Why did you agree to this interview? What do you mean? Well, I know for a fact that you turned everybody else down. Diane Sawyer, Barbara Walters. But she didn't get all the big interviews. Winters tried to get a one-on-one -on -one with Paulson's Allie Mayfair Richards from the past season of Colt. If she turned down Lana Winters, why would she talk to Rachel fucking Meadow? Now, Allie declined the opportunity to share her story on how she escaped Kai Anderson's clown cult, probably because she had plans to start a cult of her own. How about another character played by the awesome Sarah Paulson? Billy Dean Howard showed up in Murder House and Hotel. Back in season one, she was the medium that Constance hired off Craigslist to help her get in contact with her son, Tate Langdon. I've just come from a meeting at Lifetime. They're interested in making a pilot with me. A Craigslist psychic with a Hollywood agent. Who would have thought? A medium. Now this is also the time where we get our first mention of the Lost Colony of Roanoke. In 1590, on the coast of what we now know as North Carolina, the entire colony of Roanoke, all 117 men, women, and children, died inexplicably. This was neat foreshadowing for season six, as we would see the events of Roanoke play out in flashbacks throughout the whole season. And despite Dean Howard's claim that simply saying Croatoan could banish unwanted spirits, Violet's attempt to get rid of Chad proved she was mistaken. Croatoan! Just kidding. But that didn't stop her from getting a TV show, of course, because lots of people without talent are on TV. Do you know how to do your own laundry? No. And lo and behold, years later in Hotel, she shows up to interview the ghost of John for the program. Unfortunately, a bunch of serial killing ghosts at the hotel weren't fans of the Lifetime show and eventually ran her out of the building. When Madison Montgomery and Behold Chablis visit the murder house in season eight, they run into Billy. She's not all that helpful, but warns them about the dangers of attacking the spirits in the house. Who the hell are you? A friend of the house. 
<laughs> and it's residents. They don't take kindly to strangers. You ain't dead. Oh, honey, I'm one of the few live ones they let come and go. He needs someone to talk to when we aren't here. Another Roanoke connection, Edward Philippe Mott built the Big Shaker Mansion in 1792, the haunted house that Shelby and Matt Miller moved into at the beginning of Roanoke. What's really notable is that Edward is an ancestor of the Motts from Freak Show, including the serial killer Dandy who takes control of the Freak Show and his terrifying mom, Gloria. How's that? It's better. The seat's warm. Mother made it toasty for you. Bottom line, all the Motts are fucked up. Now, a fan favorite over the seven seasons has to be Pepper. Mm -hmm. And we were first introduced to her in Asylum, but it wasn't until Freak Show that we learned about how she ended up at Briarcliff Manor. In Freak Show, her and her husband, Salty, get it, Pepper, Salty, were part of a double act in Elsa's Cabinet of Curiosities. Upon Salty's death and the disbanding of the circus, Pepper was sent to live with her sister and she was pretty much treated like a slave. Pepper's sister and brother-in-law were extremely horrible people and framed her for the murder of her infant nephew. That's how she ended up at Briarcliff Manor. He took one look at the shape of my head, and I was locked up for good. That's how it works with us freaks. We get blamed for everything. Now, if you paid real close attention to the past season of Cult, you may have noticed some of your favorite freak show performers on the cover of one of those twisty comic books, including Pepper, Jimmy Darling, AKA Lobster Boy, and Meep. Uh, they loved me. The freaks were stealing them just like before. I knew what I had to do. Now, speaking of Twisty, everyone loves this killer clown, especially you, Greg. No, I do not. Twisty was, of course, featured during Freak Show, and it looks like the details of his Florida murders during the 1950s were so well known that they were turned into literature. Well, comic books to be exact. In Colt's present day Michigan, Allie and Ivy's son Ozzy is a big fan of the killer clown. But if they knew the comics were based on the real life murders less than 70 years later, I'm not so sure they would let their son read it. Now, according to Ryan Murphy, Twisty is, quote, one of four mythological monsters, along with Bloody Face, Rubber Man, and Piggy Man. And believe us, they're all terrifying. Okay, now it's not American Horror Story unless we talk about the witches. No, not that witch. Not that witch either. Yeah, there we go. The ancient witch, Scathich, played by Lady Gaga and Roanoke, was worshipped by the evil Lost Colony matriarch, the Butcher. Now, according to Ryan Murphy himself, Scathich is also the OG Supreme, aka the very first Supreme ever. That's right, she predates the Coven storyline and Salem witches by centuries. Bend them to thy will. Shed their blood. Now, Apocalypse was clearly the biggest crossover we've seen when it comes to American Horror Story, and the Coven Witches from Season 3 played a significant role in saving the world from the Apocalypse. This includes Cordelia Good, Myrtle Snow, Misty Day, Madison Montgomery, and Queenie. Get the manager! I am the manager. <laughs> <laughs> Queenie, who we know and love from her voodoo witchcraft in season three's coven, returned in hotel after coming to LA to appear on The Price is Right. Sadly, she didn't make it to the game show after the vampire Ramona took a liking to her, and the ghost of James Marsh stabbed her to death because her powers don't work on ghosts, apparently. As it turns out, Queenie was trapped inside the hotel for quite a long time. At one point, Cordelia actually tracked her down and attempted to rescue her, but she wasn't powerful enough. It wasn't until Michael Langdon came around that Queenie was freed from the walls of Hotel Cortez. Not only that, Michael was able to free both Madison Montgomery and Misty Day from their own personal hells. Madison was stuck in retail hell, while Misty was in the middle of a science class dissection. Michael yet again proved strong enough to bring them both back to the land of the living. Side note, Cordelia was able to bring back Myrtle from the dead after they executed her in season three, in order to have a full roster of coven witches to take on Michael Langdon. Charles! For God's sake! I'm working! Another character with major connections throughout the series, Dr. Montgomery, aka Surgeon to the Stars. He's first seen in season one's murder house. Charles moved to LA with his wife Nora in 1922 and built the infamous house for her, but soon became addicted to illegal drugs and illegal abortions. Decades later on Coven, we were introduced to Madison Montgomery, who like Charles and Nora is also from LA. It's extremely likely that Madison is a descendant of the Dr. Frankenstein-like couple. Let's not forget that both Madison and Charles have both brought people back from the grave. That can't be a coincidence, right? Now in Hotel, Dr. Montgomery helped the Countess in a failed abortion attempt that would lead to the birth of Bartholomew, the child of Elizabeth and James March. 
Speaking of doctors, let's not forget about Dr. Arthur Arden, aka Hans Gruper, aka one of the most evil characters in the entire series. Arden appeared in both Asylum and Freak Show, as well as Babe during a much happier time in his life. That'll do, Pig. That'll do. All jokes aside, the Briarcliff doctor turned out to be a Nazi doctor who tortured and experimented on his victims. And he was the very same doctor to amputate Elsa Mars's legs while shooting a Nazi snuff film in the flashbacks during Freak Show. Elsa was forced to use wooden legs for the rest of her life. Fun fact, James Cromwell's son, John Cromwell, played the young Hans in season two as well as season four. Poor Sister Mary Eunice. She thought she was doing noble work in Asylum until she was possessed by a demon during the exorcism of Jed. That's when she took a total 180. After getting Sister Jude committed, Mary Eunice took over as Briarcliff's head nun. She also showed up briefly in Freak Show as we learned the background of events that led to Pepper into the Asylum. She too wrongly believed that Pepper committed the horrible acts of violence, but we all knew better. You already knew this one, guys. Michael Langdon, the offspring of Vivian Harmon and Tate Langdon that we were introduced to in Murder House, grew up to become the Antichrist, and he tried to end the world in season eight. Over the course of Apocalypse, we also learned much about his upbringing. Which brings us to his grandmother, Constance. We previously saw her at the end of Murder House after leaving the hair salon. She came home to find out that Michael had killed the nanny. Raising Michael didn't get any easier from there. He continued to kill. It started with small animals, then it accelerated to humans. With all that, Constance still loved him and helped cover up all of his sins by burying them in the garden. She knew that he was evil and wasn't a normal boy. I mean, come on, he grew 10 years overnight. Her love for Michael waned and she was unable to cope with what he had turned into. Oh, and by the way, he also killed a priest. She feared for her own life and would eventually commit suicide inside the murder house, joining her children in the afterlife. We finally got to see her youngest daughter, Rose, by her side. By the end of Murder House, each member of the Harmon family, Vivian, Ben, and Violet, had died and become spirits of the house. They even had a nice Christmas together. When we caught up with them in Apocalypse, things were a bit different. First off, Vivian and Ben are no longer on speaking terms. Ben spends much of his time masturbating while crying and looking out of the window of his bedroom. Seriously, that, that happened. He formed a father-son relationship with Michael after Constance killed herself. He tried to help Michael with his demons, but the Antichrist grew more and more evil, especially after his actual dad, Tate, completely shunned him. Good job, Tate. Now, Violet isn't speaking with Tate neither, since he's an extremely horrible person, which we learned in season one. They actually reconciled at one point, thanks to some help from Madison and Behold, but thanks to Mallory's time travel, pretty much everything was negated after that. So no Tate redemption story. The longtime housekeeper of the murder house, Moira O'Hara, had slept with Constance's husband, Hugo, way back in the day. Constance shot and killed her inside the murder house, and she's been stuck there ever since. She eventually befriends the Harmons and helps to keep the new murder house family safe from the more violent spirits in the house. In Apocalypse, Madison and Behold dig up Moira's remains and relocate them to the cemetery next to her mother. Apparently, the murder house spirits can break free from the house if their remains are moved. Regardless, Moira is able to meet with her mom yet again in a touching reunion. Oh, mother. Your hands. They're as beautiful as I read. But again, this is apparently all reversed because of Mallory's time travel. Sad. I'm looking for a Dr. Ben Harmon. That's me. Detective Jack Colquitt, LAPD. I need a moment of your time. Now this one might be a stretch, but don't you think it's a little more than coincidence that both detectives in Murder House and Freak Show are named Jack Colquitt? There's nearly a 60 year time gap between them, so it's likely that they're related. Perhaps there's even a long-standing tradition of law enforcement in the family. Or this can be just some sort of inside joke, as American Horror Story producer James Wong directed an episode of The X-Files, in which the cigarette smoking man wrote a novel titled Take a Chance, A Jack Colquitt Adventure. This is a small one, but remember Marcy, the real estate agent from season one who manages to sell the murder house to the Harmon family? Uh, by the way, the Harmons obviously never watched Eddie Murphy. Well, Marcy popped up in hotel as she tried to spin off the cursed hotel to an unsuspecting client. Also, that trip to the Cortez didn't end well for Marcy, as she was killed and forced to book an eternal stay at the hotel. Now let's end this on an awesome theory from Reddit user The Drowned God. Uh, now, do you remember little Jenny Reynolds from Asylum? Of course I do, Greg. We broke down the entire season of Asylum right here on GameSpot Universe. Check it out. 
Okay, cool. Thanks for that. But um, little Jenny Reynolds, apparently she may be Miss Mead. What? I like this. Ms. Mead? Mm -hmm. She was only in one episode, The Origins of Monstrosity, where we found out that she was pretty damn evil. She killed her friend, but blamed it on some made up bearded man. Greg, do you have something to tell Move us? Move on with the video. That's when she's brought to the asylum. Yes, the asylum that was run by the devil-possessed sister Mary Eunice. They even shared a touching moment together. They're gonna lock me up in my room. I'll never be able to do anything I want ever again. Don't be a whiner. You're smarter than they are. Don't you ever forget it. Maybe you just need to learn how to defend yourself. How cute. It definitely feels like this little girl could grow up to be the Satan-worshipping devil mama, Miss Mead. The time frame at least makes sense. She would be a child in the 60s when she was admitted to the asylum, and in her mid-60s when the apocalypse rolls around. The big problem with the theory is, though, that Miss Mead told Venable about her first kill, and it was when she was a bounty hunter not as a child. But remember, that was Robomead, and it's entirely possible that she wasn't programmed with the correct memories of Jenny's first kill, and her subsequent transformation into Miriam. Now, we obviously can't confirm if this theory is true, but we'd like to think that it is. I hope so, I hope so. Let us know your favorite theories or connections that we may have missed in the comment section down below. And go back and rewatch all of the past seasons that we've broken down. Yes. We might even do another one soon. Ooh. See you next time. Bye.